Hello, this is Newton Thomas Siegel, cinematographer on Bohemian Rhapsody, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Newton Thomas Siegel is the visionary cinematographer for the highly anticipated film Bohemian Rhapsody. Tom and I discuss shooting Alexa 65, creating a visual language for Freddie Mercury's story, recreating Live Aid, and all the behind-the-scenes secrets you need to know. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Newshooter.com, Hedge.video, Shutterstock, and PremiumBeat.com. Premium, royalty-free music and sound. I am so excited for today's episode because I am so excited for Bohemian Rhapsody. Who isn't? This movie, when that trailer came out uh, over the summer, it was like, oh my God, it just really got you excited for the film. That's got to be one of the best trailers I think I've ever seen. And they've released new trailers along the way, and they've all been so good. They incorporate the music. They just have that energy that Queen really brings, and the film looks awesome. So we talked to Newton Thomas Siegel all about it. That's coming up in just a couple of minutes. But before we get there, I want to talk about Hedge. What is Hedge? Well, Hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. It's also super fast, and it keeps everything on track. You can import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations at the same time. So it's perfect for creating multiple backups. So think about this. You're on set. Your camera operators give you their media cards. Your audio person gives you their media cards. You get, you get cards all over the place. You want to make sure that everything is backed up correctly. You want to make sure it's done fast. You want to have multiple backups. Because if you don't have multiple backups, you know, what happens if your backup falls apart? You got to have multiple ones. That's how I do it. And that's how you guys should be doing it too. And I know you are. But when you use Hedge, it is so much better than just willy-nilly throwing things around in your finder. You want it to be done in a professional way. This is, you know, you guys spent a lot of time and money making sure that your stuff looks good. You, you, you have a professional approach to uh, your productions, to your shooting. You want to make sure you have a professional approach to your backups as well. And that's what Hedge is. So go to hedge.video forward slash go creative show. You get 20% off the full price. But there's also a whole bunch of different licensing options. There's a free trial. Uh, you can do it by project. And they're constantly updating the app. So you have the latest and greatest at all times. Hedge Connect is also the app for your phone. And when you have that, you get a notification when the transfer is done. So I'm sitting at lunch. I'm dumping all the footage and transferring all the footage using Hedge that, I, that, you know, that we did throughout the morning. And I get a little notification saying that it's done. And I know when I get that notification, it was done quickly. It was done correctly. And I have the peace of mind. So when I give my media cards back to my, uh, back to my camera operators and, and audio techs and they reformat them, I don't need to worry. Everything was done correctly and fast with hedge.video. So check it out, hedge.video forward slash go creative show. All right, let's dive right in because we have a lot to talk about. The new film, Bohemian Rhapsody, and so much more with cinematographer Newton Thomas Siegel. So I'm here with Newton Thomas Siegel. We're going to call you Tom. How about that? Because that's what I'm seeing online everywhere. <laughs> and I think that's the more okay. casual approach for you. Um, the director of photography for so many, so many great films. And the most recent, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, which I am very excited about. So welcome to the Go Creative Show. Thank you very much, Ben. This film, first of all, this trailer, and I know trailers are supposed to make people want to see the film. That's the point. But this trailer is got to be one of the best I've seen in years. It really does pack a punch. It gets you so excited. Uh, there's a lot to live up to in this trailer. <laughs> and I know they're starting to do screeners now. Uh, how are you feeling about the film overall? Uh, I'm really excited about this film. I mean, it's, um, it's just a fabulous story. Uh, and I think we really nailed the essence of what Freddie Mercury was all about and what Queen was all about. So, you know, I mean, movies are like lightning in a bottle and sometimes it all comes together and magic happens. And a lot of other times 
even with great material or great talent, it just something doesn't gel or doesn't click. And um, this was one case where it really came together. And in spite of, you know, uh, lots of obstacles and challenges, um, I'm really, really proud of the way the film turned out. Were you a Queen fan to start? Um, you know, to be honest, um, I enjoyed their music, but I wouldn't say I was a, a, a like a super fan or anything like that. Uh, you know, their their music was so emblematic of my generation growing up, uh, in particular the way it infiltrated in the states. Um, whereas in Queen in in the United Kingdom, uh, Queen was like just the side of the Beatles. In the United States, they were very popular, but not in the same way that they were in uh, the UK. But in spite of that, their music infiltrated almost more into the culture than it did in the UK with the way that um, some of their anthems became embraced in stadiums and sporting events. Um, you know, We Will Rock You, Another One Bites the Dust. Um, we all are the champions. Those, yeah, and we are the champions. Um, I mean, I think I didn't even realize at first that we will rock you as queen. You know, I knew it more from uh, going to the ball game, and and uh, um, but when I got this film, um, as I always do, you know, I delved into the um, uh, the history, uh, the research. I read all the books. I read everything there was to read on Freddie Mercury, on Queen. I watched all the archival material. And then I began to, you know, appreciate uh, them as musicians um, and their influence, you know, on the culture more and more. And um, it was really an eye opener for how uh, pervasive their music is and how uh, much it evolved and changed over the years. And, um, you know, what a kind of a, a, how much more complex and, and artful it was than I ever realized. I almost think that's better to like not really understand your subject when you're about to do a project on it. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I think there's something exciting about your discovery uh, as the director of photography, you're kind of discovering this band, getting into the nuances of it. That is going to inform the way that the audience discovers them throughout the throughout the film, I think. I, I really think that's an asset to not be a super fan when you jump into something like this. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's a rule, but I think for myself, it was actually much better uh, because I didn't really have any preconceived notions. You yeah. know, I didn't know enough about them or I didn't know their music well enough to really have sort of this like, uh, you know, super fan concept of, oh, I know what Queen's about. I'm going to I'm going to, you know, reproduce that. So in a way, my research and my process of learning about Queen was also my way to, you know, find my way to the to the heart of the way the movie should look. Mm. And I've read in an article of yours, too, that when you jumped into the to the X-Men franchise, you also, you know, certainly knew of them, but weren't a giant super, super fan. And you kind of had to go through a discovery during that too. So this seems like a common thing for you. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you a really funny story about, um, uh, uh, when I was, um, getting ready to leave for Toronto to do the very first X-Men, I had been staying in a friend of mine's house, uh, house sitting for him. Um, and right before I was going to leave, um, I opened a closet and I noticed all these boxes this was literally the day before I was going to leave. I noticed all these boxes up on a shelf in the closet and I pulled them down and inside were all of these plastic wrappers and in each plastic wrapper was a comic book. And I never realized it, but this fellow was a massive comic book fan and had the X-Men comics going back to X-Men 1, which wow. at the time I had no idea how massive that was. Uh, and uh, I sat up the night before I was going to leave instead of packing, reading like one after another of all these comics. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, I don't know that it's a prescription, but I think there's a lot to be said for, um, 
you know, approaching something uh, with a certain naivete or, or um, uh, you, you know, innocence so that you really can absorb it and, um, and process it uh, as if it's for the first time. And I think it can often help to, for a much fresher um, uh, outcome. I want to talk about scale in filmmaking because, you know, when you're doing giant blockbusters like X-Men, there's a certain scale to it. There's a scale that we expect. When you're doing something like Bohemian Rhapsody, it's, it's a story about people. There's no superheroes there, but there's also a scale that kind of needs to be respected because this band is so huge. And I'd love to know how you approach that. And if there are any similarities between the two types of genres. Um, I think there's similarities, but there's some significant differences. Like if you compare it to like an X-Men type movie where, you know, when you get involved in an X-Men, you're dealing with um, a lot of visual effects. Um, so, and, and I think every year it gets more so that way, you know, whereas these movies are becoming more and more virtual um, to the point where, you know, you have your Lion Kings and Jungle Books where it's virtually an animated movie. Um, so I think that these, the, the superhero movies um, are, the scale is massive because they're always trying to be bigger than the last one, yeah. but they're also very involved with visual effects, which means that you're very involved with multiple units, with previs, with a lot of things that are, um, you know, that, the cinematography is kind of a, a an element and a portion of, but it's also so many other things that contribute to that final image. The the one um, great thing about a movie like uh, Bohemian Rhapsody or maybe a movie like Valkyrie, which I did some years ago, Absolutely. is that you have a lot of scale to it because, like you say, I mean, Queen was a massive, massive band, but you're basically doing it in camera and you're really trying to, um, you know, you're telling a human story and you're telling it, um, on a, on a much more, um, handcrafted level. Um, you know, we had our share of, of visual effects because, um, there's no Wembley stadium anymore and we didn't have 130,000 extras. I know that's shocking. <laughs> um, it's true. We didn't. It wasn't like Gandhi with Richard Attenborough. Um, but so a movie like Queen, while you have some of those visual effects, um, first of all, it, they were much more specific. They were really um, about um, uh, stadiums and crowds. And they were also um, there, <clears throat> hopefully, you know, invisible effects where you um, are – just trying to create a, you know, a reality that you would have had if there was still a Wembley stadium and you could afford 130,000 people. So as opposed to world building, like you have in a, in a superhero movie, um, in a movie like Queen, you or Bohemian Rhapsody, you, you have a huge scale, um, or a big scale. Um, but it's a much more, on a much more human level. Um, and in some ways, I prefer that because you 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 have a lot more control over the final image. Uh, you have a lot more um, uh, it, it's it's a lot more management, a lot more about um, you know filmmaking and less about administration of multiple units. And you know, um, a cinematographer on a two hundred million dollar visual effects movie can really turn into a like almost an administrative function if you're not careful. I feel like I've been hearing about this for a while. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know for sure the trajectory of it, how long it's been in the making, but I feel like there's been rumblings about it for quite a few years now. And I'd love to know, you know, when you got involved and what your preparation was like. The film, you know, the story of Freddie Mercury and Queen has been, it's such an amazing story. It was like obvious somebody's going to make a movie about it. Uh, Graham King um, had the, the, you know, the passion to make this film 10 years ago. And he's been trying for 10 years along with his partner, uh, Dennis O'Sullivan to get this thing off the ground. And 
it's really been a labor of love for him. And he's, I mean, the, the uh, number of times he's come within inches of getting it off the ground only to have it all fizzle and smoke. Um, you know, are, are legendary. So by the time we were actually in production and getting going, you could just see he was like so happy. It was like, a, you know, that kid that had been asking for a bike year after year for Christmas and he finally got it. It was like, you know, you could see in his face, it was like, I can't believe we're actually finally doing it. Yeah. And that was kind of, um, I found that very invigorating, you know, to like, feel like, oh, wow, this is cool. We're like making this, this guy has had this dream and this passion for so long and we're actually making him happy. I love that. And and for you, when you started, when you got involved in the film, how do you begin to prepare for the visuals and the way you're going to shoot it? And I'd love to get an insight into the way that you prepare for a film like this. Um, well, you know, the first thing you do is you read the script, right? You go, of course. Like, oh, Wow. Okay. There's the story beginning, middle, end. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, the first thing you do is you read the, the script. Um, and I read it a few times. Uh, you start, you know, there's certain images that come right to you and formulate in your mind. And then there's, um, uh, uh things that you really like. Oh, God, what does that mean? What does that, what's that smell like? What does that, feel like what does it you know taste like and then you start doing the research when you have something like this that's based on um you know a true story so you start reading books you start looking at images you start uh watching movies um you know archival footage of queen and and i started immersing myself in the period i mean i grew up with it you know i i've my first job ever was in a record store so i you know Oh, wow. Music has been. It's been destiny. It. Yeah, it was it was destiny. I was 14 years old and I got a job in a record store. So I, you know, it was, you know, it was it was like putting on a an old coat. It was just it was that that part of it was fantastic. But I sort of reacquainted myself with, um, you know, with all the music I grew up with, with the you know the British invasion with the, all of the roots of Queen of how Queen came to be, um, and then I started uh, learning about Zanzibar and boarding schools in India where Freddie went to school. Mm. Um, so um, you know you just really uh, drown yourself in all of the material, and then you know you start to look at other films of the genre. Um, so I started looking at. Um, um, you know, films like uh, The Rose uh, with Bette Midler. And um, and I went back and revisited The Doors, which uh, I was um, lucky enough to uh, uh, work on with Bob Richardson uh, many years ago. Um, and, you know, you kind of look at what you want to take from those or what you don't want to do, how you want to do it different. Um, one of the things that was clear from the beginning of the film was that um, as a rock and roll movie, it was going to be a little different than than most of the rock and roll movies of that genre, which very often or so often uh, involved, you know, sort of a downward spiral, you know, into drugs and yeah. and uh, um, sort of you know immersing oneself in their demons, you know, and. You know, even when you get into films like Ray or, you know, the James Brown movie, but certainly all of the, you know, like the Rose or the Doors or these films where, you know, your your rock star shoots to fame and then of course, uh, you know, flies too close to the sun and starts to burn. Yeah. Um, the Bohemian Rhapsody was um, meant to. Um, be a celebration of Queen and a celebration of music, uh, of Queen's music and uh, of how, what an extraordinary performer um, Freddie was, this amazing voice and this electrifying uh, stage uh, presence that played to the very, you know, last guy in the last row of the, of the stadium. 
Um, so it was meant to be much more celebratory. Having said that, Freddie died way too young. He died of AIDS at the height of the uh, the HIV epidemic. Um, he was uh, um, somewhat closeted, or he never officially came out till the day before he died. So um, there's, um, you know, there was a lot of of um, trials and tribulations and dark side to Freddie's uh, life and eventual death. And the film um, doesn't shy away from any of that. It's all there in the movie. Um, but it's not really the focus of the movie, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the focus of the movie was really a kind of tribute to how uh, extraordinary their music is and how it all came to be. I want to talk about the look of this film. I know you had selected Alexa 65 to shoot this on, and I'd love to know why uh, and what sort of drew you to that decision. Um, this is my second film with the Alexa 65, and I just think it's a brilliant camera. And it particularly when you're telling a story that is so epic it, as Queens, it is so, you know, on such a sort of big scale, like we've been talking about earlier as Queen. Uh, it's just a perfect camera to, to, to really do them justice. What I love about the camera is that it, it has this amazing picture detail, this fine, fine detail at the same time as it's not extraordinarily sharp. It's not like it's a like, wow, look how sharp that camera is. Hmm. It's, it has a very soft, beautiful kind of painterly quality to it. And it's, it gets ex- expressed in its, in the half tones in a way, uh, uh, highlights fall off in towards shadow, the way that colors blend from one to another. It just has this tremendous, um, kind of, uh, um, uh, pictorial quality that reminds me of medium format film. Mm. It's, it's, you know, this, this whole um, race to how many K's we've got is, as I think most of us are all agreeing now, is kind of ludicrous Yeah, because uh, there's K's and there's K's and a pixel is not a pixel is not a pixel. You know, every pixel is different. Every sensor and every manufacturer makes sensors with photo sites that have different qualities to them. Um, one of the things I like about the Alexas is that the photo sites are larger, the, the, the pixels are larger, sort of a bigger paint bucket, as we like to say. And I think it just creates a different quality of, of image. Having said that, you know, I think the cameras are getting closer and closer together in terms of what they're um, putting out. And I think that's leading uh, a lot of cinematographers, including myself, to look more and more at the glass, um, which is almost more like the new film stock than the cameras themselves. Yeah. And and for this film, I know you had sort of switched up your lens sets as you went through the story of the band and, of course, the different time periods. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I, I wanted to create, you know, the, well, I'll back up. The, our story has a little tease about Live Aid at the beginning. Then we go back to 1970 when Freddie first came to London and uh, was working at London's Heathrow Airport. He was an immigrant with his family, teenager. Um, and that's when he, you know, his love for music um, found expression in the London rock scene with um, uh, where he finally met uh, uh, Roger Taylor and Brian May. Um, And uh, our movie carries it through from that moment to the formation of the band, their rise to stardom, uh, and culminates at Live Aid in 1985. So I have a 15-year span where... I go from a very um, young, naive uh, immigrant, um, you know, wannabe musician to 
arguably one of the biggest rock stars on the, on the globe. And I wanted to find a language that articulated that, that transition. So the um, period when he first came there, which is sort of the first act of the movie, really, mm. I chose to photograph with the, um, the uh, Alexa SXT and the Cook um, Speed Pancro lenses, mm. the, the, the original, the old vintage glass, as opposed to sort of their, their newer iteration, um, to kind of give it a certain bit of romanticism and um, almost kind of a idealistic naivete. Um, I created a LUT that brought out the sort of the best qualities of that lens camera combination to express that. Um, so that part of the story has that LUT. And then, you know, as they get discovered, they get representation, they get on the top of the pops. You have this evolution to the bigger stage and um, the we shift to the Alexa 65 and the airy DNA lenses um, and the LUT begins to shift. And it um, by the time you've reached the 80s, it's a much cleaner, more desaturated um, uh, uh, look than... Um, uh, than it is at the at the beginning, hmm. and it certainly reflects the storyline. It reflects the different time periods that we're dealing with. But what's the feel of it? Like there is a certain feel to that look of the more I, organic's not the right word. That that softer kind of feel of the you know early seventies look, the Cook lenses, and then this new stuff. What what is the feeling you're trying to evoke? Well. I think it was like I was saying earlier, you know, I, I wanted to express a kind of um, romanticism in it because you know, when they were starting out, it was like, you know, everything was about, you know, we're going to be the biggest rock stars in the world. You know, the world, you know, like we can do anything and and it's going to be like paradise on earth. And, yeah. you know, all I want to do is play my music. I want to be a star. Um, so all of that kind of youthful enthusiasm for lack of a better word yeah um i felt was 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 expressed really well with this kind of warm glowing kind of um uh look where your highlights are kind of halating and your um and your blacks have a kind of softness to them um it also fit really well into the Kind of design uh, and, co and 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 color palette of the '70s, where you had a lot of these oranges and yellow greens and um, and golds and you know a lot of that um, uh, kind of color palette that existed in uh, in in fashion and in art at the time. Um, so that was kind of the idea for the outset. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, as the story evolves, as the band becomes much more worldly um, and the culture itself, you know, moves uh, out of, you know, away from those sort of last remnants of the, the counterculture hippie movement into glam rock which eventually leads you out of glam rock into the world of kind of disco and the kind of cocaine fueled uh, um, decadence of the eighties. Yeah. Uh, um, there's, uh, you know, I, I wanted that look to be kind of more uh, a, a little starker. It still has a certain, I mean, there's some outrageous colors and, um, but it's colder. Like when I look at the when so I look, colder, yeah, yeah. When I when I look at the trailer and some of the uh, publicity stills that are out there, there is something <sighs> ominous is too strong of a word. But there's something where you know, you know, it's headed in a in a wrong direction almost. When you're when you're in that more shiny, colorful but cold 
80s look. Like, you know, I mean, certainly we know that things were not uh, heading in the right direction for Freddie, but there's something in the coldness of it where you know that this is no longer, it begins hopeful and then it starts becoming like you're holding on and uh, something is about to happen. That That's just the general impression from the, from the look of it. And uh, I love yeah. that. I think it's great. And I, I think, you know, it was really, I mean, one of the things I think with the color, I was sort of trying to express is how is it, it is and you know forgive me if I'm repeating myself but is you know you take this point of view which is very rose colored glasses you know uh, idealistic like anything is possible um and then you start to get more successful you get a little jaded time goes on so band members are going in different directions mm. You're trying to explore different kinds of music, and it's a starker, less um, of a fantasy world that you're in, and now you're more in the the real world of all eyes are on you, and what are you going to do next? Mm. Um, so I think that hopefully is what you know was expressed in that. Tra- that transition. Can you talk to me a little bit about you, your? Have you seen the movie? Oh, have you I'm seen sorry. The movie? No, I I was not given uh, an opportunity to see it, which is too bad. But um, there were no. You're gonna love it. I, I I mean, from that's what I'm saying. From from the materials that I have available to me, I can already kind of feel that. And um, you know, when I go into these interviews, having only seen trailers and publicity stills, I really try to look through it almost frame by frame to get a sense of, you know, the, the feel that is trying to be evoked. Obviously I have no opportunity to see it ahead of time. Uh, but which is fine. Go see it in IMAX. Well, I wanted to talk about IMAX because you're shooting large format. It's going to be put on IMAX screens. I'd love to know, uh, how you approach the film and maybe there, maybe you don't, but is there something different you do on set when you know it's going to be on IMAX? Is there a, a different way to monitor or something that, uh, that you have to do differently for the large screen. Uh, it's funny. Uh, someone asked me the same question uh, last night. Um, you know, when we were shooting, we didn't know it was going to be on IMAX. Um, oh. But I did know. But I did know it was going to be in the theater, and I knew um, it would be on a big screen somewhere. So my approach, like it usually is, you know, is that. Your choices um, uh, about things like, um, you know, lenses and cameras, um, acceptable grain noise levels, uh, all of those things, to me, you do for the largest venue possible, Um, knowing that as the venue, or dare I say iPad or iPhone, you know, gets smaller, uh, if it holds up on that big screen, it's going to hold up on that small screen. Having said that, um, this is one of the real challenges of the digital world today, which is that uh, I, that we're shooting for so many different possibilities of viewing. Yeah. And, you know, when I do a DI for a movie like Queen, I have to do... A Rec 709, I have to do an HDR, I have to do a Dolby laser, I have to do a IMAX, I have to do an IMAX laser, um, I have to do the P3. So there's like these million different versions. Um, you know, they might be subtle differences, but they are different, each one. Certainly the HDR version is going to be different. All of them, yeah. And it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting question because a lot of us are bemoaning, you know, the way people are watching movies now on iPads and laptops, which does really suck. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, your average person that used to have a, you know, saved up money for their twenty-three inch CRT uh, monitor, now has a sixty-five inch you know, OLED at home. Um, okay. Maybe that's 
<clears throat> your upper echelon. But the, the point being that people have decent systems at home now. Average yeah. TV is bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. That for $500, people are buying HD 50 inch TVs. So at the same time as, you know, our stuff is getting watched on crummier and crummier venues and we're working for places like Netflix that are telling you you're, it's not even going to go in the theater. Um, what people are watching it at, at home is, is bigger, brighter, sharper, uh, more detailed than it's ever been. And they're also so, right up against it. Like, I mean, certainly the gold standard to me still is in a movie theater, but I don't know when you're, when you're home and you're watching your set, a set that you're used to a set that you have been watching for however many years you've had that you're sitting there right there. The lights are up. You're comfortable. You are immersed in it. It is still immersive as it is in a, in a movie theater. Um, but I think the challenge is you don't have that baseline anymore. Everyone's TV is set up in a different way. And, yeah. and usually you, wrong. Exactly. I, I mean, yeah, I go to my parents' house and it looks like it does in Best Buy and it drives me insane. Um, but like the, you're just playing to so many different screens and so many different settings of those screens. Do you sort of at some point just say, I'm going to make it look the best that I can for what I'm looking on this and then just kind of cross my fingers and hope that the colorist can make this <laughs> make this work across all the different screens? Well, well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was saying was that like I I shoot for the biggest format that it will possibly be seen in and I adjust my way down to the bottom. <laughs> uh, and I, I know that if my film holds up in IMAX, I can make it work on your iPad. The music industry has been doing this for years. And, uh, I mean, God, bef way back when, uh, you still had to think about the horrible set of speakers in somebody's car, you know, You'd make a record and think to yourself, yeah, this is going to be listened to on a really fantastic sound system, but it's also going to be put on an A-track tape and thrown in some shitbox well, car. I mean, it's like, it, it, I think it's just kind of inevitable, but it seems like it's getting more and more, the more options we have. No, I, I remember, you know, some of the first films I made that, um, you know, being in the mixing studio and, you know, we had the all the great speakers and monitors. And then uh, we would have like these little small speakers up on the top of the mixing board. Um, and every now and then we would check what it sounded like on them because that's what your average at that time, your average uh, home TV had for speakers. Yeah. And it was like, well, it's got to work for, I mean, in some ways it's almost an even bigger problem for audio than it is for, for picture. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you give any leeway to audio. You give leeway to, to video, I think, a little bit. But audio, yeah. if it sounds bad, if it sounds bad, it is bad. I mean, it's just one of those things. Um, I was just having this, this discussion yesterday with uh, Matt, who mixes all... I do commercial production here. Um, I'm a commercial director uh, in Boston. And I always, before it goes to the client, I listen to the audio on uh, tablet, uh, um, on uh, laptop speakers and earbuds. And that's it. I mean, that's the reference point. I hear it on my nice speakers too, but I have to hear it on that before it gets sent out to the yeah. client. Cause I know that's what they're going to listen to it on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, you just touched on a, on a, on a, something that's um, pretty extraordinary, which is that we don't have dailies like we used to. And I'm sitting here in India and the studio is going to be watching our dailies and they're going to be watching it streamed uh over a uh, you know over uh, the internet on and i i know that there will be those who every now and then do actually uh go into the you know screening room and look at it on a big screen or a monitor or something like that hmm. but i also know the truth which is that 97 percent of the time those executives are going to be watching it on their laptop uh, with the lights on in the room and while they're <laughs> eating lunch and, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, and rolling phone calls. So, 
yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge. Let's talk about Rule Boston Camera, shall we? Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. I do it all the time, all the time. Because when I go to Rule, I know two things. One, they're going to have what I'm looking for as far as equipment goes because they have a gigantic world-class inventory of rental gear. Camera, audio, lighting, grip, communications, camera dynamics, all the movies and black arms and easy rigs and everything you love, it's all there. They have a huge selection of lenses, huge. So for those of you like me, um, you know, I think a lot of the way something looks is in the lensing and not necessarily the camera. Rule is a great place for that. They've been around for over 35 years, so they certainly know what they're doing. Uh, but that's the first reason. The second reason is the support. So you're thinking, you know, why do you need support? You're just renting equipment. Here's the thing. When I'm renting equipment, I don't own it, obviously. So I'm renting it because I don't own it. And, if I, and because I don't own it, I'm not necessarily familiar with it the way I am with my own gear. So you need to know that somebody has your back. If anything goes wrong, which is rare, but things can happen, Rule is there. And here's the thing, too. Before you even leave, they make sure you fully understand what it is that you're taking out that door. That is the support I'm talking about. They have what you need. They're going to support you. They're going to have your back. And that's going to make the production so much better. Production is mission critical. I mean, not to be dramatic about it, but it really is. You only have a very limited amount of time to get the shots that you need. And you don't want any disruptions in that flow. And when you have Rule Boston Camera behind you, you have the support you need, you have the equipment you need, and all is good in the production world. So head over there, rule.com, R-U-L-E.com, and see what they're all about. Buy some stuff, rent some stuff. You will love them. Rule.com. I want to talk about the Live Aid performance. It bookends the film. It's iconic. I mean, that Queen Live, specifically Queen's performance, I think, during Live Aid is the one that people turn to as the pinnacle of arguably probably one of the pinnacles of any live performance in music history. I mean, it's so it's super dramatic the way I'm saying it. But I think you ask anyone whether they were alive at that time or not. Live Aid is iconic. Queen's performance during Live Aid is the is the pinnacle of that of that uh, show. And Arguably, obviously, but you guys have to depict that. And the show itself is pretty like the set that it's on is pretty lackluster. I mean, it's just a, you know, a, a poster. <laughs> it's like, it's like a big white billboards that says live aid, very few lights. It's during the day. It doesn't have that cinematic look that you would think of when you think of a rock concert, but it still is dynamic. And I'd love to know how you approach that because that being the bookend of this film and where the film kind of culminates, but not having it really look that cool to begin with, I'd love to know how you approach that. Well, you just brought up the biggest challenge of the movie, which was Live Aid. And the, 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 the concert itself was to raise money for the famine in Africa. The concept of the concert was that it be a volunteer thing. Nobody's getting paid for it. It wasn't about, um, uh, you know, putting on a big ostentatious show. It was done very last minute. So it was purposely meant to have a, an austere presentation, everybody was wearing white. There's the backdrop was nothing but two, you know, uh, silhouettes of Africa. There, you, you know, anything glitzy and glammy would have been in contradistinction to the, to the idea of the concert. Mm. And then to make it worse, we're going to do it in the middle of the day. Um, <laughs> So my big dramatic third act set piece, so to speak, was done in the blandest of stages possible during the day. Um, and it, um, 
it was broadcast by the BPC, and you can go on YouTube and you can see the concert. So the world knows exactly what it looked like yeah. as it was recorded by the technology of the time. So there's um, a real challenge there in how you portray Live Aid. And like you say, Freddie's performance in Live Aid um, has been uh, described as one of the greatest rock and roll performances ever. Yeah. Um, Rolling Stone did this um, uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was a poll or uh, exactly how they came to it, but um, it was voted on the great rock and roll performance of all time. And, and, and this performance was is considered one of the greatest. And um, people who were there at Wembley will tell you that it was brutally hot. It had been going on for hours and hours. People were bored. They were bored and they were getting, and they were, and, and, and a lot of the bands hadn't taken it that seriously, that not all the music was so great. They weren't raising that much money. Queen came on the stage and the entire trajectory of the fundraising, the attention of the crowd, the entire direction of Live Aid changed. And it just blew people away. And Freddie's engagement with the audience and the way that he managed to take 130,000 really hot, sweaty, bored people and put them on their feet totally enraptured is the reason that that performance has gotten such tremendous renown. Mm. So that's the challenge and the good news. So the question is, so, all right, that sounds great. So how, how do I film it? Um, one decision and commitment that had been made was that in terms of the, the basic, um, the look of the stage, what was on the stage, um, was going to be historically accurate. And our production designer, Aaron Hay, and his team were brilliant in, you know, everything down to amps, uh, all the way down to the Pepsi cups on the top of the piano were, you know, exactly as it really was. Having said that, there's no point in really ending your movie with an, with an exact uh, replication of what you can find on YouTube by Googling, you know, live age queen performance. Yeah. For us, the, 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 the way that we were giving an audience, movie audience, something different is because we were telling a different story. The, in 1985, a billion people watched on TV uh, relatively traditional coverage of a great, great performance of a band on a stage, predominantly told from an audience point of view. We wanted to put the audience, the movie audience, up on the stage in the middle of the band in a way that told the story about what was happening in between each one of these band members mm. themselves so that it was partly about the relationship to the audience, the Wembley audience, but it was also very much about what was going on in between the various members of the band, in particular what was going on inside Freddie. And having said that, the, the, the opening of the movie, before you understand what it means to be on that stage for Freddie and Queen at that moment, we start with a tease where you see him waking up on the day of Wembley, uh, getting ready to go to the stadium, 
And we take you backstage right up to opening the curtain, seeing the crowd, and boom, we cut and you're back to 1970. Mm. When we return at the end, we start our, our return to Wembley over central London as an aerial. And the camera comes flying toward Wembley Stadium, drops down onto the crowd as the band is coming out from behind the curtain. It flies across the crowd right up to the stage into a medium shot of Freddie sitting down at the piano and starting to tune the piano. And then as the camera's coming around him and getting closer and closer and closer, he pauses. And there's this moment of silence and stillness. And there's something going on in him and you don't know what it is. Is he nervous? Is he frozen? Is he scared? Is he thinking about what, when you see the film, you learn is happening in his life? What is happening? And the band is looking at him with the same kind of trepidation about what's going to happen. I mean, is <laughs> are we going to play or what? Mm. And as it comes around, he starts to play and then we get into the concert. But it's that kind of subjective quality that the more objective uh, version you, you know, that you saw broadcast doesn't contain. Mm. So it was really um, the way that I think we, you know, we, we dealt with that challenge and um, I think took the cinema audience to a different place was by telling the story more from the inside out rather than from the objective point of view of a, of a person in the, you know, 10th row of the, of the stadium. Was that one single shot? Or do you guys yes. cut? Did you have? Did you stitch yeah. together, or did you truly get it all yeah. in one shot? There's a stitch. Um, it, just one. No, yeah, just one. Actually. Jeez, that's even. That's impressive, right there. Well, there's no stadium anymore, so um, you know the stadium had to be recreated sure. CGI wise, and as I mentioned earlier, we ironically did not have 130,000 extras. <laughs> How many did you have? 900. Oh my God. I'm, I'm, I'm always such a, like, I'm such a like little kid. Every time I see stuff like that, it's always like, wow. Even though I know it happens all the time, there's set extensions. You yeah. had people you do, th- but for some reason, it just is so impressive to me. I love those videos online when they do like the visual effects before and after it just, yes. blow- I think it's because I don't know how to do it at all. Like I, I just can't do it. I don't understand it. I know it's done. Uh, I've relied on it in the past for my own stuff, but personally, I don't know how to do it. So it's very impressive to me <laughs> every time. No, it is. It's amazing. And it's gotten to the point where, I mean, um, like when I watched Jungle Book, I, I, I was absolutely enthralled. I, I thought uh, Bill Pope's work on that was just so amazing at creating yeah. this world that didn't exist. And yet it really looked like he lit this movie, like he was there with the real camera, um, gravity, you know, that, uh, Jeevo did is similar, like, um, you know, it's, it's phenomenal, you know? Yeah. We had the and visual, think, we had the visual effects supervisor from gravity on this show to talk about how they put it together. And it, it, it's just, you think to yourself, like, how can you even, well, you've done big CGI films, but it must be so difficult to, to like, to visualize it when there's nothing there. And to keep it consistent from a DP point of view, it's certainly hard for the actors, but I think for you, because you're responsible for creating this look and you, you don't have much to go on uh, at first. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I think um, uh, the, um, from a cinematographer point of view, it's very, very difficult to stay inspired when you're looking at a big sea of green. Having said that, I think that 
when there is a director cinematographer relationship that is truly uh, collaborative and respectful, like on Gravity and Jungle Book, both of those were really good examples of where the director brought the cinematographer in very, very early. So the cinematographer, even though it's not always as traditional with, you know, uh, sitting on the dolly with the camera, uh, <clears throat> pointing it at the actors and telling the gaffer where to put the 10K, you're at least there from the ground up, from ground zero, creating and crafting the, the, um, the look of the film. And when you're allowed to come in that early and when there is that kind of collaborative relationship, I think it can be very inspiring. More often what happens is because studios don't want to pay to bring a cinematographer in that early, the cinematographer ends up coming in after a lot of that work and decision-making and stuff like that has already been done. And they sort of inherit a lot of decisions and, uh, and, and a lot of, uh, uh, previous material. And that's where I think it can get very, um, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's a lot less inspiring. It can sometimes be downright, uh, uh, uh you know, um, kind of numbing. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Start Living by Vincent Tone. Premium Beat is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. Don't forget their sound effects library. They got a lot of good ones in there. When you go to premiumbeat.com, you get access to a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as 49 bucks each. That's insanity. Because you don't just get the individual track, you get cut downs, you get loop sets, you get all sorts of assets so that you can customize the track to fit your project perfectly. But it's all about quality. Quality, quality, quality. And that's what you're going to get over at premiumbeat.com. Their stuff is really good. They've got high standards for their artists. So you know when you're looking through their library of material, you know you have really good quality stuff. So head over there. Don't just trust me. Well, trust me, of course. But don't just go off of my suggestion. Go there, listen to it, and figure it out for yourself. Premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about Shutterstock.com. Shutterstock.com has 12, over 12 million royalty-free 4K and HD video clips. 12 million! That's insane. That truly is insane. And the cool thing about it is that the stuff is really good. And it's organized in good, interesting ways. Like they, they really curate collections really, really well. So like if you go to, if you go to uh, Shutterstock.com and click on footage, you see curated collections. And this is honestly where I go first because there's oftentimes the categories that I'm looking for and I start there. And then of course you can say like videos that are similar to this and you can really just go down a rabbit hole with this stuff and have so many great clips to choose from. Sometimes I just use it as inspiration. I just recently did a video for, um, uh, for a project here locally, and we wanted to do some food photography. We wanted to have the feel of that kind of like, you know, cooking show type of vibe. And I came over here and I looked at Foodie's Paradise, which was, uh, it's a really great collection here over at Shutterstock.com. And um, there's like 40 videos in there. And they look amazing. If nothing else, they'll give you the inspiration to shoot your own stuff. But it's so high quality, you can just throw it into your own projects. And honestly, the stuff just looks so good. It gets better and better all the time. Every clip in here is 4K, and they've just got so many 4K clips. It's great. So you have that flexibility if you're delivering in HD to, like, punch in, get new shots. It's just really good stuff over there. Their blog is awesome. I very rarely talk about the blog, but I should be doing it more. But I encourage you to go there and check that out as well. But really, it's about quality, and it's about variety, and it's about the ability to find what you're looking for. And all of those three things are over there at Shutterstock.com. So check it out, and really check out those curated collections. Those are excellent, and the, uh, the stuff's really top-notch, too. So check it out, Shutterstock.com. 
All right, there is still more to talk about with Newton Thomas Siegel, and it's coming up right now. In our last couple of minutes, you sort of led me right into uh, a question I wanted to ask about your relationship with the director, because it's directed by Brian Singer, but at the very end, uh, you guys switch to uh, Dexter Fletcher to direct the final weeks of filming. And um, from your perspective, what was it like making that transition? Well, it's never great to change directors, you know, uh, during a production, but um, I've done a pretty much every movie that uh, Brian Singer has made since Usual Suspects. So, uh, you know, I, I feel I have a very intimate um, sort of uh, uh, knowledge of his taste and sort of his uh, vision. And in this particular case, you know, um, when Dexter came on, we had already shot the overwhelming majority of the movie. Sure. So the movie really had set its course and its tone and its look. Uh, and um, Dexter was wonderful because he was very respectful of it. You know, a, a, a lot of guys could have come in there and sort of wanted to show off and said, like, oh, I'll, you know, fix this. I'm going to – here's what we're going to do. We're going to – turn it around the other way and go in that direction. Yeah. Um, but he didn't do that. You know, he was very, he, 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 I think he loved the material that had been shot so far. And, um, he was very, you know, respectful about c carrying it on in the same direction. And I think, um, you know, it's what helped, um, uh, Dexter and myself find a really good working relationship. I, you know, I enjoyed working with him. It was very, very easy, very painless. And, you know, the crew was like, uh, this is one of the most enthusiastic crews I've, I've had in many years. Uh, and they were really, um, uh, so committed to making the movie that, I, uh, um, it, it was, you know, a lot less painful than it might otherwise have been. And I think that's reflected in the movie. I think one of the reasons the movie is so good is that um, the vision that had been, uh, you know, uh, be begun 10 years ago with Graham King first getting this property and then uh, gotten off the ground with uh, Brian uh, Singer and then taken to the finish line with Dexter – stayed very true all the way through. And I think because of that, um, it, um, uh, it reflects why the film is as good as it is. Did Dexter stay on to go through the post or did it go back to Brian? Um, no, Dexter, um, was there in post. Um, Dexter was also prepping uh, rocket man, the Elton John story. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Dexter definitely had his, um, uh, you know, his input, um, but we also were very fortunate to have John Ottman, um, who uh, is the editor I've worked with on uh, all but one of Brian's movies. Um, so John and I have a very close working relationship, and um, he's a terrific editor and composer. And um, that really, I think, also was a significant part of um, uh, carrying the um, – continuity through from the beginning of the, of, of the movie to the end. I can't wait to see this thing. It comes out November 2nd, I believe. Uh, November in, 2nd in, uh, comes out November 2nd, in the United States of America in every IMAX theater near you. Uh, it opens October 24th in the United Kingdom. So, so excited and so happy to have you on. I really appreciate it. And I know you're knee deep in another film. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? I'm um, doing a movie that's uh, being produced by the Russo brothers and directed by Sam Hargrave. Uh, it's called DACA, and it stars Chris Hemsworth. Um, and um, I have to say, I think Sam Hargrave is a huge talent that you guys uh, should be watching in the very near future because uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of him. Well, let's have you back on to talk about that film.
Let's have Sam on to talk about that film. I think you should. I would love it. I would love I it. Think, I think I have to say goodbye now so I can go meet with him and figure out our shot list. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. And we'll have you back for the next film. All righty. Take care. I want to thank Newton Thomas Siegel for coming on the show. He has quite a portfolio, guys. You've probably seen a million of his movies already and may not have even known it. Check out his IMDb. It's staggering. I also want to thank Matt Russell. He's staggering, too, but for different reasons. His sexiness, that's what it is. He just gives off an air of sexiness. You can find him over at uh, gainstructure.com. And why would you want to find him? I'll tell you. Because he mixes, he masters, and he makes this show sound so good. He does all of my post-production audio and mixing for any project that goes through BC Media Productions. And he can work for you, too. How about that? So reach out to him. Let him know what you have going on, and he will do a fantastic job for you. You can find him on Twitter at GainStructure and online at GainStructure.com. And while you're online, check out GoCreativeShow.com. Check us out on Twitter at GoCreativeShow. Let us know what you think of the show. And of course, our sponsors, Hedge, Rule Boston Camera, News Shooter, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat.